The question is, for each and every one of us, and I really believe this, what is the business you're in? Like if I went to your sales team today, and I said, what is the business you're in, what would they say? If I came to your marketing department, would they say the same thing? Now usually, we like to talk about that thing we do. Oh, we're accountants. But are you accountants? Is that the business you are in? Because this is the great question, my friends. So let's look at it. What allows many of you, let's say ladies in this room, to buy a pair of high heels without trying them on first? Ten years ago, you don't do that. Today, you do. What allows the customers of CarMax to buy thousands of cars a year without actually test driving the vehicle first? Or in my case, as a pool guy, just a silent partner today, but I still oversee a couple of things. This year, we've already sold a dozen swimming pools, over $100,000 each, without first setting foot in the home. And so the question is, how does that happen? Why would anyone spend $100,000 on a pool and not actually meet face-to-face -face the salesperson first? What is happening with all of these industries? And fundamentally, I can tell you that the one thing that is as prevalent today as it's ever been and will always be is the business that we're all in. Because when all is said and done, you and I, we're in the business of trust. That is the battle we're in. You came here, do not fool yourselves. You didn't come here for content marketing. You didn't come here for digital. You didn't come here for sales. You came here so we could figure it out together how can we engender more trust than anybody else in the world in our space. That's the battle. That is the goal. That is the obsession. As a marketer, that has to be your obsession. Leadership team, that must be your obsession. When people think a question in your space, do they think about you? Do they know they can come to you and get all the answers? And I'm telling you, is that going to be as relevant in 20 years as it is today? So much of what we learn here and see here won't necessarily be relevant in 20 years and 30 years. This is the tie that binds every single business in this room. Because we're all so different, and we like to claim that we're different. And yes, there are many things about us different, big, small, local, national, B2B, B2C, B2G, some of us. But the thing that binds us together is this battle that we're all in, which is the battle of trust. I'd ask you to consider that as you move forward. My quick story, yes, I used to be a pool guy. In fact, we started this company, River Pools, in 2001. Things were going okay up until this date and number. Anybody know what that date and number represents? Anybody know? Go ahead and say it. Sorry, that was the market crash. Good or bad day for pool guys? Very bad day for pool guys. Within 48 hours of that day, we had five people withdraw deposits and said, we just can't do it. We can't do it. So we lost a quarter of a million dollars in business in the first 48 hours. And over the coming months, things started to get worse and worse and worse. And by January of 2009, we were going over the edge. And I really mean going over the edge. All of my business and personal credit cards were maxed out. I went through a period of three straight weeks overdrawn in my bank account. You say, how is that possible? I don't know, but we did it. And I was depressed. And I was scared. I was going to lose my home. My two business partners were going to lose their home. And the one place I felt like we hadn't really tapped into was the digital consumer. That was the one thing that we could do to save the business. And of course, as you know, we did. But as I read all these fancy phrases that we talk so much about in this world of marketing, the thing that kept coming back to me, four simple words, was, Marcus, if you just hear what they're saying and you're willing to address it more honestly, more transparently, more prolifically, more consistently than anybody else in your space, and more creatively, you just might be successful. And that became our fundamental philosophy as a business. And to make a long story short, as you can see from the left side of the screen, in 2009, we're getting a couple thousand visitors a month to the website. This year, and by the way, the reason why it's wavy is that's what's called a seasonal business, okay? Busy in the summer, not so busy in the winter. 
And so, of course, this year we've averaged during the summer about 600,000 visitors a month. Today, River Pools is the most traffic swimming pool website in the world. But it all happened because we had one singular obsession, which was, can we engender more trust than anyone in our space? Because that's what we do. Because that's what we do. Now, I want to talk about the qualities that I am seeing from the companies that have been great over the last six or seven years as I've been in this game, but I think it's the qualities that you and I must have if we want to continue to be great. Because it's crazy what's happening out there. Things come and go all the time. And when I talk about come and go, specifically, I love this concept or the idea of the difference between a principle and a platform. What is the difference between a principle and a platform? This is a question that we have to ask ourselves every single day because sometimes when you're making a decision with your business, if you have to choose between two things, almost always you should lean towards principle, not towards platform. And I'm not anti-platform. So what are platforms? Platforms come and go. Case in point, this is six years old, this slide right here. Six years old. Some of you remember some of these companies, don't you? Check them out. There's about 75 on the screen. There's 75 on the screen. Facebook there, Yelp still there, Skype still there. How's Squid Do doing? I thought Squid Do was the big thing. Seth, Seth Godin, gonna be big. So there's 75 on the screen. How many, how many do you think are still doing very well? Anybody have a guess? In other words, they're still alive and kicking at least semi well. Anybody have a guess? Just give me, throw out a number, anybody. Okay, all right. So this is what we got. This is what we got. We've got 33 dead. We've got 30 that are alive. And we've got 12 that are tinkering on death right now. Now, you may have done well on some of these platforms when they were here. And certainly, there are platforms today that have proven themselves worthy of our attention. But the fact is, they come and they go. But principles do not. When you think of principles, what do you think in our world? What do you think? What comes to your mind? I'll tell you what comes to my mind. When prospects visit our website, do we help solve their problems better than anyone else in the world? That's a principle. Great teaching is a principle. Great communication is a principle. Trust is a principle. And it will not die. It will not go away. It will be as relevant in 20 and 30 and 50 years as it is today, assuming we even have websites. But the principle of solving problems is eternal for businesses like you and I. That's where we are. And so I would challenge you to think like that. Think in terms of these things. And then when the platform changes, you carry the principle over to the platform. When you leave MySpace and come to Facebook, you carry it over and so you're ready for the next thing, whatever that is. Because if you see the ones that have been able to adapt, it's because they are a principle-driven organization and they get it and they understand it. So that's number one. Number two. Number two. So we've all heard the phrases and there's you know, debates about this number. Forrester's done the research. 70%, let's just call it, of the buying decision is made before they call you before they contact you before they talk to your sales team 70 percent on average some industries it's higher some it's lower but i know this it was a lot lower a few years ago you take this number 15 years ago 15 years ago and you say what percentage of the buying decision was made before someone actually talked to your organization 15 years ago what do you think the number was anybody in the room shout it out anybody 20 percent i'll 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 buy my guess, and I, I don't know, my guess it's 20 to 30 percent 15 years ago. Starting to get online, starting to make it happen. But today we're at 70 percent on average, on average. So the question is, where is it going to be over the next 5 to 10 to 15 years? We know this, it's not going back. It's not going back. And if it's not going back, what are you and I doing about it? And this changes everything because for the longest time, sales carried everything. But they don't even have 30% of the buying decision today unless they're involved 
in the sales process long before the traditional sense, which is why we've got to get rid of these silos that are sales and marketing. We've got to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes. It's crazy. Does your sales team, if I came to your sales team right now and I said to them, what percentage of the buying decision do you dictate, what would they say? Do you know what they would say? If they don't understand this number, we got problems because we're going to struggle to get buy-in and we're going to struggle to make the changes and we're going to struggle to get their help because they need us today as marketers. They need us. Does your leadership team understand this? It's funny. I talk to a lot of organizations. They come to me and they brag about their high closing rates. But what are they doing? They're struggling financially. Literally, many of them are going out of business. Nobody cares about your high closing rates if you're going out of business. Because high closing rates today mean nothing like they did 10 or 15 years ago. It's not a brag. It's no longer a brag. Because if we're not generating the trust in the lead, we have no business. And they're vetting us. And they're essentially buying from us before we ever know they exist. That is the game that we're all in. That is the game. Number three. Number three, by a show of hands, and I want everybody to participate because I need your help with this. How many of you feel like your sales team and your leadership team has your same vision that you do in marketing? By a show of hands, raise your hand. Raise it high. High, not a 90, a high. Look around the room. This should scare you to death. It's scary, isn't it? Why is this happening? Peter, why is it happening, my man? We've got less than 5% of the room where the organization shares the same vision. And then we wonder, as marketeers, why we can't get the approval for that next program, for that marketing automation, or for this email campaign, or for this other person that we desperately need on staff because we're wearing 15 hats and we can't possibly take on another. And it's because we don't have the same vision. And it starts from the top. If we are not educating the top, here's the thing, and I mentioned this yesterday in my silo session. It is dramatically more important that your sales team is here content marketing world than you are here yourself. I talked to a salesperson yesterday. In the sales track now, I talked to a salesperson. I had about 150, 200 people in this room. He came to me afterwards. Now, there was about 10 salespeople in the sales track yesterday of 200 people. And he came to me, he said, Marcus, I came to this conference kicking and screaming. It's literally what he said. I've been here half a day and everything has changed. Everything has changed. It's more important that your leadership team and that your sales team is here than you. You go to the sales conference. That's how we've got to think today. That's how we've got to think going forward. That's the only way we're going to eliminate these terrible silos. Now, this person right here, Krista Controlla, love this lady. Her company's called Block Imaging International. What they do is refurbish medical imaging equipment. In other words, they'll take an old MRI machine that's been put out to pasture and they'll refurb it and they'll sell it to a health organization that can't necessarily afford a new one because a new MRI costs about $2 million. Krista came to me about five years ago and she said, Marcus, we believe in this philosophy of they ask you answer. We believe that we should do this, or at least I believe it. But the problem is, Marcus, I'm not a subject matter expert. And I go to my sales team, I go to my leadership team, and of course, what did they tell her? I don't have the time. No, that's not what I do. If you keep hearing you don't have, they don't have the time, it's because we have failed to explain the thing well. It's never about time. It's about a lack of education and understanding. And if we want them to understand it, we've got to teach it to them. So Krista really changed my life because I was still kind of a pool guy. And she said, Marcus, I want you to come out to my organization and I want you to convince my sales team that they want to be a part of marketing. And this changed my life. That was the day I stopped really being a pool guy and said, there's something else I need to do. And since then, I've done this all over the world. This idea of getting by, and I believe in it so much. And it's the one thing I think we do pretty well. The one thing. And so we go out, we give them a workshop. We have 65 people in the room. Since that time, over 45 of the 65 people in the room, 
many of which were engineers and sales team, have helped produce content for the company. Of course, with the facilitation and with the help of the marketing team. And here's where they went from that. 2011 in July, that's when we had, July 2011 is when we had this workshop. But we got everybody on the same vision, on the same team, what, how, why, they got it. The sales team understood the impact on them individually, but also on the collective. And because of that, of course, they exploded. Here's a direct quote from Krista. She says, because of insourcing, in other words, using our employees to help produce this content, which we should all be doing because we're already paying these people and they're subject matter experts and they hear the questions all day long. They have the answers all day long. Why are we not asking them? We're not subject matter experts in marketing. We're good at marketing. We're not good at MRIs. That's why we have a sales team. That's why we have engineers. That's why we have a customer service team. That's why they need to be involved. That's my challenge to you. We can account for at least 20 million in sales we otherwise never would have gotten. Now you say, how big is their business? And scale it out for your company because we have billion dollar companies in this room right now and we have companies of a few hundred thousand dollars. Scale it out to you, she does about $35 million a year. That's the impact on their business. In fact, here's a direct email. Now, here's the question for you. This is a salesperson that sent her an email five or six months ago, okay? So this is five years after the fact, after that first workshop, after we started to embrace a culture instead of a program of content marketing. I want you to follow along, again, from a salesperson to the CMO. Guys, y'all may be sick of hearing these stories, but I still get a kick out of it. I just had a conference call with a paid management center in Arkansas. Come to find out before we even spoke, the purchaser had printed off several of my blogs to bring to her board meeting and enabled her to answer questions on comparison models, budgets, what equipment they needed, etc. She had read and seen so much of her content, she said she couldn't wait to talk to me. She told me who my competitors were and how much they were quoting. Even when I told her we would likely charge more, she said, but I trust you guys. I'd rather work with you. I realize they don't all line up like this, but when our funnel is working at its best, it is so, so, so sweet. I'm sure I could still find a way to screw up the deal, but the point is, I couldn't be better set up to succeed. The effort to produce the content is worth it. Thank you to the stellar efforts of our marketing team for truly setting us apart. My question for you is this, when was the last time your marketing department got an email like that from the sales team?